Hello, everyone. I'm Alexa Zumwalt, the Director of Federal Growth and Strategy at Snorkel AI, and it is my absolute pleasure to welcome you to this virtual summit hosted by Snorkel. While the title of today's event, Trustworthy AI, A Practical Roadmap for Government, seems simple, many of us know all too well the complexities of explaining and justifying how AI ML systems are designed and how they produce a given result. Today, we have a number of exciting talks and a panel session exploring trustworthy AI and how this new set of ethics requirements affects highly regulated industries such as finance, healthcare, governance, and national security. Before we get before we get going, let's address the necessary housekeeping. The chat will be disabled during today's event, but feel free to email events at Snorkel AI if you're experiencing any technical difficulties. Our moderators will be monitoring this email closely throughout the event, so feel free to get in touch. As a reminder, this event is being recorded and we will make talks as well as our white paper on trustworthy AI available to all participants after the event. And with that, let's jump right in. Our first speaker earned their PhD in computer science from Stanford, where he, where he started and led the Snorkel Open Source Project. He is an assistant professor of computer science at the University of Washington, and is also the CEO and co-founder of Snorkel AI. Please join me in welcoming Alex Ratner. Alex. Alexis, thank you so much. Um, awesome. So, uh, I'm, I'm uh, extremely excited and more importantly, extremely humbled to have uh, this group together today to talk about this, um, you know, uh, extremely important, obviously, uh, topic of um, trustworthy AI. And obviously, we're interested in having a, a broad conversation about, you know, ways to enable this. So I'm going to give a, a slightly opinionated uh, framing of the problem and, and some ideas uh, around this notion of, um, you know, AI development and deployment and trust increasingly centering around the data that these AI or machine learning models are trained with and uh, give an example of how we're tackling that at a very high level, just as a brief primer at Snorkel, but also just to kind of frame some of the discussion for a broader uh, uh, you know, spectrum of ideas. So to start, I'll, I'll, I'll frame with a couple of, of uh, um, you know, requirements that we see with, uh, you know, uh, customers across a variety of industries and also obviously in, in the federal space that um, you know, are, are critical for actually having operational trust in AI systems. Now, I'm, I'm uh, not going to claim this is an exhaustive or, or, or fully, uh, you know, fully complete list, but just to frame some of the conversation. Um, first of all, you know, it's paramount that we are able to understand what goes in uh, and teaches our AI and ML models uh, increasingly. Uh, more and more of the modeling process that goes into building these these you know AI applications and and the models that we deploy is really entirely determined by the data and we specifically call it the, the training data that these models fit to as they get more and more advanced as even you know hyperparameter searches and model selection and algorithm selection and and feature engineering and all these things where there used to be manual intervention are inc increasingly learned from the data the data becomes increasingly paramount to be able to govern and audit and inspect because it really determines what the models do and our trust in them. Um, being able to explain decisions and errors specifically and then trace them uh, back to uh, uh, you know, data that is going in um, is, is critical. Being able to actually go back and not just correct errors, but also correct biases uh, systematically. This is obviously uh, of extreme importance. And then one that uh, kind of overlaps with these other three categories that I'll just uh, put up there because I think it's it's so important and and often overlooked both in operational um, you know uh, patterns and also even in organizational structures is this uh, need to have a close link between the subject matter expert, the SME, who knows how to label the data, who knows the data, knows the problem objectives, and the data science team or the modeling team that is that is building um, the 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 actual model and. Uh, I'll throw out there uh, what is probably unsurprising for those of you that, that know uh, where I'm coming from uh, with the snorkel perspective, but you know, it, in our view, all of these uh, increasingly center on the data and specifically the training data that AI or more specifically machine learning models learn from. Uh, this ability to audit and inspect, uh, to trace back errors, to correct errors and biases, and to have a common ground for subject matter expert and data scientists to collaborate on a lot of this uh, uh, increasingly centers on the data and how we label and manage it in practice. 
So this, you know, uh, it coincides with a big, you know, broader shift, even outside of concerns of trustworthy AI, in terms of where AI development and where AI success or failure, uh, you know, lives today. And increasingly, it's around the data, the data labeling, the data development. And this is what we often refer to as, um, you know, a data-centric uh, AI development workflow. So just to introduce this idea, and again, this um, will not apply to every uh, talk or element of the discussion today, but it's just a, a little bit of a framing of how we look at it at Snorkel and something that my co-founder, Braden Hancock, will be talking about in more depth uh, in one of the sessions later on. Um, you know, five plus years ago, if you looked at any AI, uh, or, or again, more specifically, machine learning development pipeline, you know, the, the data that this model learned from would be something that you, you know, downloaded from a place like Kaggle or you got from uh, a SME or line of business collaborator via an Excel spreadsheet. And you kind of just thought of it as exogenous to your process. It just you know, came in, it was fixed, and then you got to work developing your model. And that was what you as a data scientist or AI ML practitioner actually did to develop and maintain, modify uh, uh, ML pipelines. And increasingly, um, you know, it's actually kind of flipped in, in a lot of practical settings where the models have become increasingly powerful, increasingly complex in black box, and increasingly standardized. So often the model is fairly fixed and the data, um, and we'll get into how a models today are also increasingly data hungry, becomes the key bottleneck and the key development point to kind of iteratively label and manage and shape and, and develop to build and maintain ML models. So again, data-centric AI as a catchphrase may sound kind of, uh, um, you know, vacuous or, or, or tautological because it's, it's, you know, of course, uh, you know, AI systems today and especially uh, in particular machine learning systems are informed by the data. But really what we mean with this phrase is that the data is increasingly the center point of development and it's where, um, you know, success or failure is decided with ML models. And it's also increasingly, if you buy my argument, where trust in AI systems is established or not. And of course, it's not actually an either or, successful de development and successful trust requires both trust in the data and trust in the models. But again, I think some of what you'll be hearing about today will you know, be about this, this new frontier of really building data-centric development workflows and building ways to trust the data that informs so much of AI today. So I'll, I'll uh, skip through this uh, uh, without dwelling too much, but just to kind of uh, reemphasize that, that high level framing point that we've seen over the last you know, five plus years, especially this big tectonic shift, a lot of it is underscored by this, this uh, transition from, you know, um, kind of, uh, uh, you know, models that were defined over manually engineered features to these kind of representation or feature learning, often deep learning models that are you know, extremely powerful, extremely, uh, uh, you know, automated in terms of requiring less uh, human engineering per data type or task type, but also extremely black box, extremely data hungry. And this is not to say that all ML problems are done with these models today or should, should be, but they're increasingly the norm in terms of what people are using. And it has really, again, shifted the focus. And it's worth also noting that um, you know these model architectures are incre increasingly uh, you know convergent and standardized and, and accessible and you know this is really exciting for the field because it's it's creating this vast wave of democratization of, of ML tooling, but it's also um, creating new difficulties because these model architectures are very black box, very difficult to understand what they're doing or, or how to modify them or how to you know uh, you know edit or or, or inspect them. And they're increasingly complex, meaning as a rough rule of thumb, they're increasingly data hungry. And specifically, they're data hungry for carefully labeled uh, what's called training data that they learn from. So if you want to you know, detect whether a network packet is uh, malicious or not, you need a bunch of network packets that have been labeled in that way. If you want to detect whether um, an, a chest x-ray is, is uh, problematic or not, again, you need to have had a bunch of you know, SMEs, in this case doctors, sitting there labeling uh, chest x-rays to teach that model. And the volume and quality and distribution and maintenance of these training data sets is increasingly the arbiter of, of success or failure and also of, of trust. Um, and it's not easy, especially in the federal space. And so this is one thing that's, that's worth just, uh, again, reemphasizing to frame 
is that a lot of ML progress today has been based on, you know, the the you know the big public data sets of kind of you know public uh, you know standard uh, data and task types. You know, stop sign versus pedestrians, cats versus dogs, hot dog versus hamburger. All these these you know types of, of data sets that have been out there, um, you know, publicly on the internet. Uh, or that can be get gotten by kind of you know outsourced solutions of you know sending some data to some lay annotators uh, somewhere to to you know label by hand and, and send back. You know these solutions are are very impractical even for the world's most well-funded organizations, whether in government or outside of it. And this is because most real-world use cases require some kind of subject matter expertise. It's not just you know cat versus dog. It's uh, looking at a chest X-ray or a a you know, specific complex type of document uh, or, or report or uh, an, a complex, uh, uh, you know, image where there are, you know, complexities to the task that require, you know, a doctor, a lawyer, uh, a government SME, a, a network technician, et cetera, to actually label and, and manage. Real world data is often private where it can't just be shipped out to be labeled uh, in kind of uh, cheap outsourced ways, but has to be handled uh, in-house and, and, you know, with specific constraints and silos. And real world data and objectives almost always change rapidly. Data coming in changes. The objectives, the, the mission objectives of what you actually want your model to predict over that data change rapidly. And so, you know, a lot of these uh, blockers uh, really make, you know, the kind of legacy manual approaches to labeling this data and curating and adapting over time non starters even for the world's most well funded ML orgs. But it's not just, uh, and this is getting into more of the the, the topic uh, du jour. It's it's not just about the kind of practical uh, infeasibility of the ways that we've, you know, relied on uh, creating uh, training data sets and maintaining them for ML over the last you know five ten plus years. It's also uh, the the uh, ramifications for trust. So when you have labeled training data, you know, you then take a machine learning model and the machine learning model's job, at least in the standard supervised learning setting that is the workhorse for most modeling uh, today uh, in practice, the job of that model is just to fit to that, uh, that data set as well as possible without overfitting. Uh, basically, you know, this labeled data determines what the model does to, to a large degree. So immediately, you know, a lot of the questions around trustworthy AI really just cascade back to the data. How do we inspect or correct potential biases in the data? How do we govern or audit a, a massive uh, manually labeled training data set? How do we trace the lineage of errors that a model makes in production or testing back to uh, sources of those errors in the, the training data? And solving these critical challenges around establishing trust and, and governance is extraordinarily difficult. It's actually, you know, you know, in many cases, as hard or harder than the original modeling problem that you're trying to tackle if you're just relying on, you know, this kind of large ad hoc manually labeled data set. Um, and again, you know, things like human labeler biases uh, that are very difficult to tease out um, uh, that, you know, create these, these kinds of uh, challenges along with just, you know, difficulty of actually tracing the lineage back. So that's a, a little bit of a, a, a framing perspective, obviously biased towards our experience at Snorkel, but a little bit of a framing perspective of in general why, you know, the increasing dependency of AI and ML on data and specifically the training data and the difficulties around not just creating these data sets in the, the standard kind of manual ways for most real world settings and certainly in federal settings, but also the, the difficulties, the, the severe difficulties around, you know, trustworthy and ethical AI. But hopefully uh, a, a better you know, framing for this discussion today is that it's our firm belief uh, here at, at Snorkel and in this broader, uh, I believe, community of people working on these data-centric methods and systems that data-centric AI also creates significant opportunities for trustworthy AI. AI. And in particular, you know, the easiest thing to say, this is agno you know, not, not specific to Snorkel at all, is that as the community shifts attention to the data, it, you know, shifts the attention where it always should have been um, and allows us to focus on uh, one of the most critical pieces of the pipeline that's kind of been you know, relegated to the sidelines and ignored and actually treat it as the first class citizen of the process that it should be and has to be if we want to create actually uh, trustworthy systems.
So I'll, you know, now just take the last, you know, four uh, minutes or so to give an example of a data centric AI system that can, uh, you know, create a new way to establish trust with AI um, through trust in the data that determines that AI. And as you could probably guess, I'm going to talk a little bit about Snorkel. But again, I want to emphasize that I'm really excited today to talk about, you know, things that are broader and higher level than, than obviously just, just uh, um, our product Snorkel Flow. So just to give a little bit of example of, of a you know of an example of these opportunities that data centric AI methods and innovation can create for establishing trust, um, I'll talk a little bit about Snorkel. So we started as a project. Um, uh, a lot of the key motivation and, and funding came from uh, a, a range of amazing government partners over the years. Uh, this is still going on with my co-founder Chris Ray at Stanford and and also at a range of other. Uh, institutions and obviously here at Snorkel, where the the team uh, has has transitioned to. And at a high level, uh, a lot of the approach starts with trying to, uh, or you know, the pivot point, so to speak, is trying to you know switch from labeling data by hand to turning it into a kind of software development process where you're labeling data and managing it more broadly and developing it with code. And this doesn't magically solve. The need to put time and effort into uh, into labeling and managing and developing and relabeling and adapting your training data sets, but rather when it's successful and we've you know published both in the peer review literature and with customer case studies many cases where it's been massively successful, it turns it into something more akin to a software development activity where you know you can create these training data sets um, you know with uh, a couple lines of code or a couple of button pushes, and more importantly you can go back and look at them. And audit them and change them and correct them the way you would with a code base uh, versus having this uh, extraordinarily, uh, you know, intuitively and even theoretically difficult task of having to correct or change or debias massive hand labeled data sets. So there's no, uh, you know, just to say this as framing, there's no solution for the requirement of, of in our view, of, of effort to go into developing data. And there's no substitute for, you know, organizational commitments to, you know, to inspecting and debiasing and maintaining trustworthy AI systems. But uh, these kind of programmatic data centric interfaces like we're building at Snorkel Flow can you know, affect a zero to one step change of organizations abilities to actually uh, play that role. So just to give again a little bit of an example and my co-founder Braden will talk more about um, this in, in his talk. But at a high level, you know, our, our platform Snorkel Flow is uh, a data centric AI development platform centered around this idea of you know, developing uh, your data and, and your training data um, in an iterative and, and data centric fashion. So, um, you know, this starts with an idea of, um, and I, I promise I once knew how to write Python, so sorry for the, the, the indentation error here. This is a formatting mistake. But, um, you know, basic idea being, you know, asking SMEs, working with data scientists to, to write what we call labeling functions to programmatically label and manipulate data. This can be done uh, via Python uh, uh, or other SDKs. It can be done via push button interfaces for SMEs to drive. But the main point is to take the labeling activity from this kind of, you know, click on one document or image or, or, or data point at a time into um, an activity where you're directly encoding your expertise in a functional form. Uh, a lot of what the work on the academic side, uh, you know, uh, did was enable us to, uh, you know, with, with, you know, in, in principled ways, kind of clean and combine and integrate this um, much more efficient and inspectable and trustworthy, but also often kind of messier and more heuristic type of programmatic input. And then being able to get guidance from models and error analysis loops of where you go next to iterate in this new kind of development workflow. So just kind of three key ideas. And again, I, you know, I'll present this specific to Snorkel Flow, but I think it is, you know, all three of these are things that we can aim towards with really, you know, a, a broader universe of, of data centric uh, techniques and practices. You know, one is the ability to have governance and auditability of your of your data, right? So um, the same way that you want to be able to actually understand in some interpretable way why uh, a software artifact that you deployed did something. The ability to actually go back and trace why a model did something at the data level. Um, in Snorkel Flow, this is accomplished by looking at the labeling functions and understanding uh, by looking at a couple of uh, functions or lines of code what actually labeled the data and, and trained the model to do X, Y, or Z. 
Um, the second thing is the importance of, of explainability through data lineage. So being able to interpret why a model did something by tracing all the way back to the data that taught it to do something. And again, you know, there's a straightforward way to do that in snorkel flow, but it's a broader idea as well that we think is extraordinarily important for trustworthy AI systems moving forward. And the final thing, of course, is the ability to make, and this is important, systematic uh, changes and corrections to data sets. So, um, you know, if your model is making an error or actually has some kind of more pernicious or, or problematic bias, um, you know, in general, models learn from, they, they, they aggregate statistics over data sets. So you can't just go back and, you know, change one or two examples and say, okay, we fixed it. You need to have ways to make systematic corrections to your data. And obviously, uh, the programmatic approach in historical flow enables you to do that. But again, this is a broader idea, in my view, of what we need to do to enable trustworthy AI systems. So I'm one minute over. Um, I'm going to, you know, uh, uh, pause there. And hopefully I presented a little bit of, you know, framing for uh, some of the, the, the challenges and requirements of trustworthy AI in this new data-centric regime that we've, we've headed into uh, with ML and AI systems today, but also some of the opportunities, both, uh, you know, how we're tackling them at SnorkelFlow as an example that my co-founder Braden will talk about more later today, but also just in more general senses of, of how, you know, data moving into the limelight in AI finally today in a proper way creates significant opportunities to build more actually trustworthy AI systems um, that are also highly impactful for mission objectives. So with that, I'll, uh, I'll wrap. And I just want to reemphasize that, you know, uh, speaking for myself, but I think for the whole uh, team and everyone here could not be more, more incredibly humbled to have um, uh, Greg and, and the rest of the folks that are talking today. And so thank you to everyone, um, both talking and in the audience for, for joining us today. And I'm excited to talk more about these ideas at all these levels, you know, uh, again, a little bit more about snorkel you'll hear about uh, later on in talks, but more importantly, just talking about trustworthy AI broadly and in this data centric AI regime that we've moved into uh, today. Thank you so much, Alex. Um, we really appreciated that introduction. Uh, our next guest is the Chief Technology Officer of the FBI. In addition to his responsibilities for technology, innovation, and strategy at the FBI, he leads efforts around management, policy, and governance of AI systems. He is the chair of the FBI's Scientific Working Group on Artificial Intelligence, serves as one of three DOJ responsible officials for AI, and is the chair of the DOJ's AI Committee of Interest. If we have any Jeopardy lovers out there, the correct question is, who is Gregory Erie? Please join me in welcoming the CTO of the FBI, Mr. Greg Erie. Thanks so much, uh, uh, Alexis. I really, I really appreciate that introduction. And, and, uh, and Alex, uh, thank you. Thank you. For that uh, that talk as well, it really highlights highlights some important issues. Um, but it's great to see virtually a mix of people working on on trustworthy AI. Um, it, it's an exciting and it's an important area. Uh, it's, it's one that I care about personally, and, and I'm really looking forward to learning from uh, some of the other talks and, and panels this afternoon as as well. So uh, so to start uh, briefly, the the FBI has has a long history of identifying. Um, to enhance um, our capabilities and to carry out our mission. Uh, so at the same time, uh, the FBI must uphold the Constitution, uh, always operating clearly within the bounds of law and policy. Uh, at, at FBI, we, we need to deliver on both effective AI and on trustworthy AI uh, simultaneously. Uh, the field of AI is no longer new uh, in, in, in that sense, but, but, but it, can, it, can, it can still feel that way uh, when it comes to the management of AI systems. Uh, technical advances uh, are arriving at a, a really fast, extraordinary pace, uh, and that includes advances in fundamental research and applications of AI systems. And in parallel, we're also seeing rapid advances in areas related to the ethics of AI, uh, better understanding of risks, ways of thinking holistically about systems, uh, technical and procedural controls that can be used to ensure that AI systems operate in a uh, trustworthy way. One, one way that, that I think it, you, can, you can encapsulate this challenge of, of parallel advancements as this, which is if I ask a data scientist to make a minimum viable AI system, uh, maybe it's research code or as a training exercise, 
so they can go on the internet. Uh, they can find some high quality resources, uh, you know, blogs, things on GitHub, that sort of thing. And they can make they can make a make a thing that works in, in pretty much in an afternoon. But but if I ask a data scientist to make make me a minimum viable, trustworthy AI system, uh, at first blush, well, 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 I mean, how do you start with that, right? And at first blush, they pretty much need to start today with a literature review. Uh, how to assess the bias of models and data sets. Uh, what are they going to do to control for model drift? And, and what, what tools to use for explainability and so on? Uh, and not even talking yet about procedural controls. So, so for this kind of data science research project, I don't have a guarantee of, of delivery, much less of time. This, this is hard, right? Both of these things uh, together and simultaneously are, are, really, are really quite hard. And so although this talk will focus on our management of AI uh, rather than on applications, um, I, I want to start at the beginning as well. I, I think it can sometimes help to have a concrete reference points for the kinds of AI use cases fall into two broad categories, which are which are triage and biometrics. And, and by triage, I mean various kinds of text, uh, image, audio, and, and video capabilities that can help an agents and analysts review the information we gather in investigations and, and via tips from the public. And the primary AI-based biometrics use case at FBI is, is facial recognition. Uh, operationally, these are areas where, where the FBI needs to properly handle massive amounts of data. And, and that includes in, in critically time sensitive conditions. To, to, to give a sense of this, in, in the 2017 Las Vegas uh, concert shooting, that, that, that generated more than a petabyte of data from hotel surveillance cameras, from computers, mobile phones, and other devices. And, and it ultimately led to FBI needing to tag and mark more than 21,000 hours of video. High quality tools, in, including AI, are essential for handling the volumes of data that we require for our missions. Uh, both the triage and, and biometrics use cases are today valuable for FBI investigations, and and they're and they're going to be essential in the future too. So so we we need to be able to deliver to deliver on this. All, all of the FBI's AI applications uh, need to operate within the Constitution, law, and policy, and and we carefully apply legal and ethical controls to ensure that's always the case. The most important of these controls is that our AI use cases all have direct human accountability. Uh, in other words, a human being is ultimately accountable for the actions taken, not an AI. Uh, in our triage and our biometric AI applications, the, the FBI implements this by having agents and analysts evaluate the results of the AI as lead information, and, and, and they need to take responsibility for acting on that information. There's no... Um, and without video, you have to apologize, but there's no air quotes, blame the AI excuse available here. All, all right now of the FBI's current and planned use cases, AI use cases, each ensure human accountability in some part by having a human in the loop set up, which means that a human is involved in every decision. But the non-negotiable requirement for human accountability, that, that's got to hold true even if potential future AI use cases are, are built to operate at, at high speed. Uh, for, for example, AI applications to cybersecurity might need to act to prevent malware execution faster than a human could review the relevant data. So a human in the loop system or control isn't going to work there. But regardless of the system type, a human being a human being ultimately has to be responsible for any of the actions taken and and must not operate the system, whatever it is, if they can't take that responsibility. And, and this requirement of human control and accountability is probably the most powerful ethical control in our toolbox. Um, but, but it still is only addressing a portion of the requirements that we're obligated to meet. And, and specific to artificial intelligence, Executive Order 13960, titled Promoting the Use of Trustworthy Artificial Intelligence in the Federal Government, uh, pretty well on point for the title of this, uh, this session today. But, but that, that executive order covers our, our use of AI on non-national security systems. And, and to give a flavor of these, that the EO re it requires that AI use cases be, um, I'm going to read them here, they're important, but it requires that they be lawful and respectful of our nation's values, purposeful and performance driven, accurate, reliable, and effective, safe, secure, and resilient, understandable, responsible, and traceable, 
regularly monitored, transparent, and accountable. The ODNI principles, or the Office of the Director of National Intelligence, the ODNI principles of artificial intelligence ethics for the intelligence community, and the associated framework with that, that covers our use of AI on, on national security systems. Um, and it has similar but not identical requirements. Uh, many other US government agencies, uh, foreign governments, and international organizations, they, they have also come out with similar but not identical ethical standards. Uh, even though the FBI isn't bound by these other standards, we, we still want to understand the ideas behind them and potentially be able to meet them towards the goal of, of furthering our, our law enforcement partnerships. The first step in, in what we're what we're doing for AI compliance efforts, the, the first the first like entry point into this kind of complicated space is enumeration. So we needed to group the list of standards across the various ethics policies and guidance. And, and, and once that's grouped, we, we, we began to, to organize technical and procedural controls inside of the FBI that could address each area. And we, and we use kind of standards must, should, may language here to do that. Uh, but let me give you a specific example. So the understandable requirement from the executive order that I just read uh, read off a, a, a couple of seconds ago, that, that, that's really similar uh, to a requirement from the, the called transparency, explainability and, interpret, and, and interpretability, uh, and that portion of the ODNI framework. And so in that example, we can group these together and, and provide model controls that, that address both of them. And, and, and here the use case, it, it must, and so what we have for that is that the use case must certify, we must certify that the system, it couldn't have been accomplished with a simpler model. So let's not use an AI system if a small and inherently explainable model would have done the job, right? So if you can solve the problem with, with a small regression or a, you know maybe a, a decision tree or a couple of them in a random forest, let's not use AI at all, right? Well, let, let's, let's use the thing that's just inherently explainable. The, the use case must explain or communicate uncertainty around results. So there are a lot of tools for the job for this. Um, classical statistics, confidence intervals, uh, credible intervals, invasion stuff, text warnings, just alerting users, visual design of the system. You could go on. There, are, Again, there are a lot of things you can do to communicate uncertainty, but you've got to have something in place. And then the use case should have user training, the format of which could vary by use case. Um, and it should have explainability or interpretability measures. And so these could include applications of, of, algor of various algorithms, so LIME, SHAP, uh, you know, or, or, um, or projection algorithms, so TSNE, UMAP, or the like. Uh, it could be display of nearby data points as you're making a decision, or the use of commercial tools. Uh, again, a lot of possibilities here, but it's something that you, you probably should have related to your use case. And then any May op options would come after this, and that's more of a resource for, for our systems implementers. And, and, and we have a lot of other requirement groups and they're addressed in simple, simpler, similar ways. You know, I, I read off nine of these for the executive order. Um, so you know, we, we've done pretty much the same thing for those too. I'm not gonna go through all of them here. On, on the control side, I, th I think it's worth noting that uh, the three things came up so often that we actually pull them out and address them separately from the specific elements or, or, or principles that they support. Uh, and those three are training, auditing, and continuous monitoring. And, and again, these have, you know, we, we've kind of enumerated requirements for them in the must, should, may language. And these almost function as sub-principles because they apply to so many of the, the ethical and controls elsewhere in the process. So even though we've pulled out the bare minimum must items in this in this language that, that that's not sufficient really to make a system ethical uh, in, in in fact as, as as the fbi sought external and internal input on setting up our our ai compliance program it, it became increased increasingly clear it was communicated quite clearly to us that, it, that a checklist approach uh, it isn't right and 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 that the best practice is is to holistically evaluate each each ai use case uh, at, at the FBI, we, we implement this holistic evaluation using an AI ethics council. And, and that really borrows a lot of ideas from the institutional review boards or IRBs that are used in medical ethics. And, and, and that group, the AI ethics council is built from the ground up with diversity in mind, which was also communicated to us as a very important thing in the evaluation of AI systems. Checklists and intake questionnaires serve as a guide. And we do want them in place because they help 
us and they help a group like the AI Ethics Council with consistency. But the AI Ethics Council must ultimately deliberate and evaluate the controls of a use case in the context of the overall use case itself and any other controls that are, that are being implemented too. And, and, and that structure is in place to formalize the rigor that we expect in ethical evaluations. But, but it also enables us to be responsive to the, the pretty fast changing environments of AI, of AI ethics and of research across both fields. Another thing I'll, I'll kind of point out here is that this, this council structure, it, it, also set, it also helps us to set a coherent framework to evaluate areas where checklists just outright aren't suitable or may not yet be defined. Uh, for, for example, I'm not aware of a mathematical way or criterion of stating when an AI prediction has been sufficiently explained uh, or of codifying what it means to be explained to whom. So developers, statisticians, and, and operators of the systems all need probably different kinds of explanations. And, and, and these are not things that I know of any, um, any bright lines for. Or, or on the topics of responsibility and traceability, uh, which cover human roles and the need for the FBI to be able to unwind how a decision was made. Well, these, these, these concepts are primarily about procedural controls in, in my mind, rather than technical ones. And, and the FBI is keenly aware that we need to have robust processes in place for these items. Our, our work is, in some senses, pretty likely to end up uh, in front of a judge because of what the FBI does. And, and, and for any AI use case, I expect that the right answer about responsibility and, and traceability, it's gonna require a lot of expertise from many different disciplines, right? Depending on what exactly the use case is. And, and probably that, and, and, and that really needs to be evaluated by humans. Um, and so, so ultimately trustworthy AI, it, 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 it depends on both human and technical factors. And the way we've implemented that, the way we're managing that at FBI is using a human-driven process to holistically evaluate them and, and ensure compliance with policy and, and, and with the law. And, and for, the, for, the, for the remaining part of my talk, um, what, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna kind of go through a, a grab bag of, of what I think or what I've observed of, as either open, open questions uh, or areas where we welcome, we at the FBI welcome and encourage uh, external work. Um, academic, commercial, open source, and non-governmental, we need it all. And we, we really appreciate the contributions from around the community here. Um, I, I should take a brief aside here and also mention a housekeeping thing that, that, I, that I might have time for questions, but I think I will have time for questions in this talk. And, and I think Alexis uh, mentioned uh, that there was an email address being monitored for the session. So if, if there are questions that arise, uh, perhaps Alexis or, or someone from the Snorkel team could put that email address in, in the chat. But but if there are questions that arise, um, that would be a, a good place to submit them. Um, okay, so hi. Yep, pass yes. back on. Uh, yep, it, the email address is events at snorkel.ai. Feel free to email that and Greg, continue on. Okay, yeah, th thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. So, okay, so back from the housekeeping aside. Uh, so for the last part of the talk, I'm gonna kind of go over a grab bag of, of some of the things that, like open questions and areas. Um, and again, we, we really need the whole community here. Uh, we, we rely on, on a lot of the high quality work that's going on around us. So the first chunk of these is about standards processes. And so I, I think many of the people on, this, on the call are probably aware that there are a lot of ongoing ether, efforts around AI standards. And, and actually many of these may, you know, are, are open to the public, which is great. Uh, some of that work is very high level. Uh, like quite high level, and, and, and we see that field as, as mostly saturated. And, and, and I'll be a little bit sharp here, right? There are diminishing returns for having the N plus first framework that gives a definition of artificial intelligence, or that tells me that explainability is a valuable goal for AI. Um, we get it, uh, I get it, and, and those things have you know, really diminishing returns, and in some cases, even negative values. I'll explain in a moment. Um, and, and, and instead, here, here's some alternative thoughts. You know, if you do find yourself thinking about or perhaps working on some of these standards processes, here's some alternative thoughts about, about kind of how our experience overlaps with these, these processes. The, fir the first is, is uh, goes under the term ethical interoperability. And, and this is a concept from, uh, from Dr. David Danks, who's now at, at UCSD. And, and, and that focuses on how organizations can partner under slightly different sets of ethical standards. So if the FBI works on an AI use case under the executive order standard of being 
accurate, reliable, and effective, is that sufficient to also meet, say, the US Department of Defense standard that an AI must be equitable? Uh, well, you know, maybe. Uh, how about vice versa, right? If it's if an AI is equitable, does that meet the standard of accurate, reliable, and effective? Um, partially, it probably doesn't meet the whole standard. But 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 it's it's, it's sort of difficult to to go through and and uh, and disambiguate these. You know, what what's how do we meet each standard, and what you know, if you meet one standard, do you meet another standard? And and, and we care because partnerships are are incredibly important for the FBI, uh, for for artificial intelligence and otherwise. We 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 really want to be able to share tools, knowledge, uh, results with our partners. And you know, pretty much all the AI ethics standards that we've reviewed, the, at a high level, they're all generally compatible, even if they differ in specific terminology or inclusions. And, and, and so we really do think this is possible. And, and, and we're running a careful and, and a considered compliance process for responsible AI at the FBI. And it's based on the standards that apply to the FBI. But this is pretty time consuming. It's, it's you know, ex expensive in a variety of ways. And, and we, we're not really keen to duplicate it for every standard under the sun. Instead, we, we really think that everyone is, is probably going to be better off if there's a common core of ethical standards or maybe some other kind of framework for the exchange of responsible and trustworthy artificial intelligence systems. So, so if you find uh, yourself on the call, you know, for the folks on the call, if you find yourself in a position of providing input to high level ethical principles, I'd ask you to consider whether minor modifications are needed at all or if there's existing work that can just be reused as is. Um, and please don't neglect here the switching costs of issuing principles that are similar but not identical to ones that already do exist. On the ethical science side, so for, for folks more involved in that, or perhaps in the research community, is, is there a principled way that we can over, that we can evaluate the overlap of these ethical principles? Uh, I'd really be interested in that. Or, or can we build a framework that could help an organization like the FBI? And you'll, and you'll have to, uh, you know, par pardon my kind of... Uh, co-opting of, of the of the software phrase, can we comply once and then run anywhere with our AI use cases? Uh, that, that would be really, really valuable to us. And, and we think it could support our partnerships. And, and this is a good segue into the NIST AI risk management framework. So, so NIST is currently running a process that to define a risk management framework for AI. Uh, notionally, that's expected to be delivered by January of, of next year. And it's, and it's public, so, so everyone can participate and, and the result will be stronger for, for it. Uh, and, and, and I would encourage you to, to actually do just that. Um, it, you know, this is, this is pretty good at this sort of thing. They, they have a strong track record, really, of being able to produce standards of, like, of this type uh, through open and collaborative processes. And, and organizations, including US government agencies, have been able to incorporate other NIST standards, other NIST risk management frameworks specifically, in, into um, the one, the primary one that comes to mind for me is, is that these are already incorporated into our cybersecurity evaluations. So, so this is ground, this is a management structure and, and kind of a, a construct that we, we as government agencies kind of understand already. And, 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 I, and I throw out to the group, what, what lessons can the AI ethics field, the trustworthy AI field, take away from the processes and procedures that we're already using to manage cybersecurity? So perhaps there will be analogs of job roles that we that we see in the security field, like information system security officers or approving officials, or maybe tools. So uh, things like governance, risk, and compliance. Uh, sometimes we create a GRC tools and software that can help us manage the inventory and the, and the life cycle of AI risks. So 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 managerially, there are some structures in place, and I think there are, there are good ideas that we can take from them. But but regardless of what we do there, I think we need to bridge the gap. Uh, which is to say that there, there's high quality research on the technical aspects of AI ethics, um, really quite a lot of great papers at, at some of the, the leading conferences, um, more, more focus sessions and, and, and uh, tutorials and these kinds of things, really high quality work. And, and of course, there's a lot of high quality work on technical aspects of AI across the board as well. Uh, you know, the FBI can engage in some of these areas, uh, but, but our primary requirement isn't, isn't really a research one. Our, our primary requirement is, and what I have my eye on, is that we need to be able to effectively implement the technical and procedural controls available and to put, to put them together in a way that ensures that we are following the law and the Constitution. And, 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 that, and that's an area that I'd highlight, is that the FBI, that we at the FBI, we haven't found a lot of work at that intersection. 
how do we apply existing technical controls to meet existing higher level ethical or AI trust, trustworthy AI principles? And, and, and so can, can the AI technical and ethical community create tools that would let a data scientist make, as my example at the, at the start of the talk, to, that could make a trustworthy AI product just as easily or just as quickly as it is for them to make an AI product? You know, I, I'd love to see easy to follow end to end examples, you know, something that just works out of the box. In the FBI's workflow, kind of the, the AI Ethics Council uh, uh, thing that I, that I described, we, we, what we'd hope for are things like tra translational tooling, like, like libraries or uh, implementing controls or, or examples, tutorials, checklists, these kinds of things. Um, you know, we know the checklists aren't sufficient, but, but that they can improve the baseline quality of all of our AI systems. And, and this would better let our, our controls, our, our AI Ethics Council, focus on the holistic evaluations. And, and finally, in this, this chunk about standards, I, I mentioned this, I'll, I'm going to call out a specific ethics and technical controls research questions, which is I'd be really interested to understand more about procedures for human accountability when you don't or cannot have a human in the loop. So early, early, recall earlier, I mentioned that the FBI's current AI use cases all do have a human in the loop. And, and that's an important control for us. But the research direction in the field of AI generally includes use cases where humans cannot be in the loop. And, and, and I gave cybersecurity tooling as an example, right? You need to stop malware from executing more quickly than a human can evaluate the features going into an AI model. So, so with that and, and similar kinds of AI research, what, what, what procedures exactly, like very specifically, should we be thinking about in anticipation of these future AI use cases where we cannot have a human in the loop. So, so remember, we must have human accountability. That, that's a non-negotiable for an organization like the FBI. But, but the charge or, or the thing that I'd, I'd really be interested in from, from the community, the research or the commercial community or anyone else is, can we write down the, the tooling, the auditing, the, the explanation, the, uh, the alerting requirements, these kinds of things that we would want to use for a use case where human review has to be asynchronous. Um, moving away then from standards processes, I said I think quite a, quite a lot on that. I, I also want to kind of, kind of offer a couple of words about about commercial artificial intelligence systems. And and uh, and first first is about compliance information. So so group, groups outside of the U.S. government working on AI. So so what can you do to help, right? So so if you're outside the U.S. government and you're working on AI, you know think about compliance from the start of your R and D. Um, tracking the provenance of your data is really important. And building the system so that the, an end user like the government could understand the components of the data pipelines as well as the system overall, right? So not just a system in a box or some integrated system, but you know, we might have, because of our requirements and missions, we might have specialized integration that we need to do. And so it could help us a lot if we can understand the component parts as, as well as the system overall. And, and, and on AI ethics, it, it, it's extremely challenging for us or for anyone, I would think, to, to demonstrate trustworthy AI or ethical compliance with just top-level performance data. So th there, there's good research here. Uh, model cards and data sheets for data sets are some promising innovation in this area over the last few years. I guess this is not really a couple years old now. And, and, and we observe that they, they cover the kind of information that, that regularly comes up when, when our AI Ethics Council evaluates use cases. So those might be some examples for the kinds of things that commercial or other partners for the FBI could, could build into their, their design and their R&D and their development processes that could help us a lot down the road. On a separate topic, so some, some commercial people are, some commercial companies are, and, and, and private companies and other partners are, are working on, on AI, not as a kind of a bespoke use case, but, but AI is in a common commercial product. Uh, and, and so that's an area that we aren't focused on as much in our in our in the FBI's management of AI, and, and which is to be specific, that's artificial intelligence systems that are incorporated or embodied in common things. Uh, so think like you know map navigation systems or or word processors, which you know these days you know you know spell check isn't just looking at a dictionary, right? It, it, it's it's often based on on a natural language processing system, for example. So 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 we know there there are embedded or embodied AI in these kinds of things. And 
And at the FBI, you know, our use of these common commercial products, it still has to comply with law and policy. But, but if the products are truly common, like, like in the word processing or, or navigation system example, you know, the, the FBI isn't the best agency to evaluate that. We, we really need to be able to inherit a well, a set, like a set of well-governed and trustworthy AI systems and controls whenever we use these kinds of products. And we'd love to see standards bodies or maybe self-organization uh, that can take on that assurance problem. At the government level, the NIST AI risk management framework, that could be a thing to help here. Um, or other standards could, or, or again, self-organization. But, but that, that's something that in, in non-bespoke AI applications, we'd really love to be able to inherit. And then maybe just a word about, um, uh, for, for, for our, on our, our commercial and other partners, a word about responsible technology development. So, and this is more general than AI, although I'll give an AI example. So, so the FBI, we, we encourage the responsible development of technology in general. So, so we know that, we, we all know, not just the FBI, but everyone really knows that, that emerging technologies, they're, they're full of promise, but, but they can be misused. Um, in, including for unlawful purposes. And as an AI specific example here, um, synthetic content generated um, by, by GANs or, or um, a, a generative adversarial networks uh, tends, tends to be one of the, the, the techniques used for these kinds of things. Uh, sometimes these are called deep picks is, is a term that, that appears. But, but these, these can be used for legal purposes like fraud in, in addition to their myriad lawful uses. And, and, and so I want to specifically applaud and call out the efforts of companies to think about and to address the wider impacts of their products at the outset. And, and, and in your discretion to, to guide the outputs towards legal use or to take actions that could deter illegal usage of, of emerging technologies. Uh, this could be things like rate limiting, server side logging, uh, prompts in a user interface. Uh, I mean, these are some ideas, right? I don't, I don't know what would be appropriate for every application or even any, any given application. You know, a, a company or, or, or a private individual or an academic group, you know, you're gonna know your, your technology area way better than the FBI ever could. It, it, it's up to you, right? right? But, but what I ask is that, you know, this is not some sort of mandate or anything like that, but, but, but give it a think, right? Think about the wider social implications of emerging technology as you're making it happen. And, and, you know, I, I think, and, you know, on the academic side, you know, you started to see um, things like social impact statements uh, coming in and creeping into the ap academic literature is something that, you know, a lot of AI research should consider. I think that's a good step. Um, but, you know, we can think about that more broadly for emerging technology, too. Um, give, it, give, give it a think. It's, it's, it's an issue that matters. And, and, and think about wh whether, whether or not you can play a part in that, please. And, and, and lastly, I, I want to discuss... Um, uh, people, right? So people, people are essential. You know, an organization, FBI is a really big organization, and it, it, like in any kind of emerging technology, the the organization has to get the capability to deal with it through the knowledge and through the skills of its of its people, and 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 that extends to compliance. You know, we 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 have a, this 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 human process that I that I described to you in a, a couple minutes ago, and. And the, and the FBI needs to, to build the skills and knowledge, not, not only to perform mission tasks efficiently and, and accurately like in, in emerging technology areas, but we also really need to be able to document, to check, and to be able to demonstrate that our work is compliant. And, and in AI, data science and data literacy skills are essential. And, and I see academic and, and private sector partnerships as, as probably the main way we're getting there. Uh, that includes everything from massive online courses to specialized degree programs uh, to commercial training and exchanges. You know, and I found the latter personally to be very helpful. So, but but I'll share two two observations in, uh, on in, in this area about people that re that really make me hopeful for the future, and and I hope that makes you hopeful too. The the first is that the preparation of incoming technical personnel into the government to to deal with data and AI topics, um, that that's never been better. Right, so, so I've been around for a while in this, and and you know you've seen curricula improve tremendously over the over the last decade. Um, programming wise, uh, you know programming skills are becoming routine. Uh, you know they don't need to be taught from scratch for for incoming folks from technical fields. And there's a wide variety of high quality data science, um, ML, or machine learning, and, and statistics classes around. Uh, that includes courses specific to AI ethics and trustworthy AI. I mean there, there's really great stuff going around, and 
and everyone is dealing with data just through, throughout its entire life cycle, including in, in the management of trustworthy AI, but just throughout the entire life cycle of data. And, um, and it shows and the people and the tools that are coming into government. And so, so this, this, this set of progress has made me really hopeful regarding the people that, that, are, that are doing this kind of work in government. And, and, and the second thing, uh, uh, and this is not a paid endorsement of our attorneys, just to be clear, but, but the, the, the second thing that, is that I, I've really seen incredible engagement by, by FBI and DOJ attorneys um, across the whole scope of legal practice areas uh, on AI-related topics. It's, it's really been incredible, to, to be honest. And, and, and my legal colleagues, you know, I, I, I suspect a lot of the, the audience here might be more technical, right? But, but my, my legal colleagues, they're, they're really asking sophisticated questions. And, and it's, it's impressive. They, they've, they've been working with data scientists. You know, they've been asking and, and getting training on technical issues. And I know at least one of, one of, my, uh, one of, my, one of my legal colleagues that is working on an after hours degree in data science. So they're really gonna get it right. You know, it, it's an important area and, and I really have a lot of confidence that the legal community is doing a bunch of the right things here. And so that's something that I, I, uh, I guess I get probably get more of a chance to see than the average technical person. And, and it's, it's really been awesome to see. Well, so, so those are helpful areas on the people side. And, and I just want to say to, to keep it up, uh, I, I hope that we all keep building on the progress in this area. And, and I'm humbled by the engagement in all directions. And, and really, I, I can't wait to see the future progress that lets us all get better um, at that together. So, all right. All right, guys, that, that, that's a lot. I'm happy to take a, a crack at any questions. And I'll, I'll probably take one more crack to see if I can get my, my webcam working too. Greg, thank you so much. And um, I just have to say that you're helping me accomplish life goal right now because I've always wanted to be on a podcast. So I'm going to keep my camera off to uh, give you one question, if that's okay with you. Yes, I, I'm so sorry, guys. I, I don't know what happened. I, I tested the camera this morning and I guess it didn't it, work now. It's completely fine. Um, so we did have one question that actually um, gets to something that you mentioned. For explainability, who's the primary audience for the explanation? Is it for data scientists and engineers or for analysts and decision makers? And what are they looking for from those explanations? Yeah, so, so the, the question about explainability and who the primary audience is, I mean, it's really it's really all of them. And, and I think they need different kinds of explainability. You know, so a data scientist for explainability might, might, need, uh, might need error metrics, you know, of, of various kinds and, and know how to interpret that. But, but that, not, that might not be in the format that an analyst would, would be able to use that kind of explainability. Perhaps an analyst or, or a decision maker might be better served by seeing what a nearby in some you know, abstract metric space example would, would, would look like. Um, you, you know, so, so, so I, I think that that's, that's, pretty, um, that's pretty specific to the human factors. And, and, I, and I hope that's kind of one of the things that, that, that's come across from, from my uh, just talk, not video, but <laughs> from, 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 my, from my talk is, is that the, this, this field of trustworthy AI and, and of management and compliance of AI, it's, it's not just technical controls. You know, we need to integrate the entire process and so, you know, if you want to know what, what explainability means to an analyst or an FBI to an agent, you, you know, you probably better go ask. <laughs> uh, similarly to decision makers, you know, this isn't the kind of thing that should occur in a vacuum. Um, but, but, it, but it really, in, in my mind, it incorporates at least those three groups and probably some others too. And then on the management side, you know, we, we'd have to, like, I don't know of any way to, to think about that without, like, like I don't know of any, any technical bright lines that says, like, yeah, you've explained it to these like job series groups well enough. So like you, you at, on the management side, you probably need a human to evaluate whether or not there there is enough explainability too. Well, Greg, thank you so much. We really appreciate um, you know you coming and speaking to us all today. This has been um, very uh, insightful, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you guys so much for having me. Really appreciate it. And I'm looking forward to the rest of the uh, rest of the afternoon. Wonderful. Okay, Greg, thank you. Again, uh, just quickly from Alex. Also, thank you so much for the the awesome chat uh, or talk, and uh, and just your time today. It's it's amazing to get that kind of purview, uh, uh, you know, from 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 lawyers to uh, to talking about you know Lyme and Schaff and interpretability methods and and, and ethical research. Um, uh, really appreciate you, you know, sharing all your perspective there. Thank you, Alex. Um, our next speaker is a co-founder and head of technology at Snorkel AI. Before Snorkel, he researched and developed new interfaces to machine learning systems in academia at Stanford, MIT, John Hopkins, and BYU, as well as in industry at Facebook and Google. Please join me in welcoming Braden Hancock. 
Take it away, Brandon. Thanks, Alexis. All right. Well, yes, thank you for that introduction and for those um, talks, Greg and Alex. Uh, as was um, has been hit well by both of them, I think there are a lot of um, obvious apparent needs for having AI that is trustworthy for various reasons. And uh, I, I would just posit if it was easy to do, people would already be doing it, right? It's a clear a, a clear improvement um, over over sort of black box systems. But um, you know, one of the fundamental reasons that we found for why uh, it's not uh, currently um, something that that most organizations can achieve or or are um, able to make much progress with is because uh, much of AI and, and again more specifically machine learning today, which has you know training sets, is um, is based on a foundational you know building block the, that, that labeling process, which just uh, is naturally a barrier to allowing for for a trustworthy process, a transparent and clear uh, process. So, Alex introduced some of these ideas. Uh, I'm going to go just a little bit deeper today talking about you know, one of the core technologies that enables uh, the Snorkel Flow platform, you know, which we build in the Snorkel project, which we've been working on for the past you know, five or so years, originally at Stanford and now um, here at the company. And, um, and programmatic labeling, you know, you'll see, and I'll, I'll try and highlight here, how this enables a lot of those different axes that Alex indicated are, are priorities and, and sort of uh, you know, uh, things must haves, I guess, for, for enabling trust for the AI, and, uh, and then the, the ramifications of that downstream. So there we go. Um, so why trustworthy AI and government specifically? You know, Snorkel supports uh, customers in a variety of different industries. We've um, we do uh, insurance, we do uh, finance, you know, things that have highly you know regulated uh, areas, and also a lot of you know model risk management uh, protocols and things they're interested in. Um, so on top of I'd say just uh, it being a, a generally good idea, an ethical, responsible thing to do to have your AI be um, be trustworthy. There are also a whole bunch of other <laughs> Um, very explicit reasons why it's important in government. And we've got some of those here. So, you know, executive orders saying that we need to foster public trust uh, in these systems. They need to be traceable, uh, monitored, transparent um, in another executive order. Uh, in some of the AI strategy docs, there are outlines for why we need to, you know, minimize uh, unintended bias, again, be transparent and auditable. That's a word I like quite a bit, that ability to, uh, you know, inspect what exactly happened here, not just the final model, but the process that led to that model, being able to recreate and uh, and redo as necessary uh, that in a way that's not you know cost prohibitive or time prohibitive. Um, here, you know, additional doc talking about explainability and interpretability being high uh, high priorities uh, from the Department of Justice in you know ethical governance. That's another great word um, for this this whole sort of 360 um, concept of of really you know having control over and insight into. What your what your ML models or AI systems are doing and why, uh, and then uh, the from the White House, you know, uh, recently the, the the need to lead the world um, in in trust for the AI. So lots of of additional reasons on top of just um, you know being a responsible thing to do. Uh, it's important that we have um, you know that this is something that we're that we're working toward as as a country and as you know government agencies. And uh, and hopefully you'll, you'll see here in, in the talk today why that is so much more likely to be obtained when you when you build your AI systems on technology that is just naturally more fit for a transparent process rather than um, what is what is often the current state um, today, which is manual labeling. So uh, I won't harp on this too much. Alex touched on this, and, and I think anybody who's worked on uh, ML uh, systems in practice knows that uh, this is the big bottleneck for for applications today. Um, I, I laugh a little bit that in, in academia, step one is download the data set and step two is start doing fancy things with models. Whereas uh, in, you know, in, in uh, industry or government or you know, out in the field where you're applying this to real world problems, steps like one through eight are you know, figure out what data set we need and how you're going to collect it. And is it accurate enough? And are the annotators doing what we need them to? And you know, all these different iterations to finally get the data set. And then the modeling is the easy part at the end of the day. Um, you know, far more than whether your your ResNet has 132 or 145 layers, uh, it's going to be the data that makes a big difference in in you achieving quality, uh, but also, you know, as we'll see, uh, a transparent process and an understanding for why your model's behaving the way that it is. So definitely it's a bottleneck for uh, time to market for AI app, uh, you know, solutions. It's a bottleneck for cost. Um, it's a bottleneck for who all can be involved in the process um, as you need you know, individuals to look at each and every data point. And, um, you know, it should come as no surprise at this point, 
Uh, it's also a key blocker, as I've mentioned a couple times, for those trustworthy aspects. So um, I'm gonna, gonna outline here real quick um, some of these key requirements. Alex previewed these. I'm gonna be able to go in a little bit more detail today with uh, a running example and some, uh, uh, you know, a little bit deeper dive. Um, he shared four. I added one more. Couldn't help myself. Um, I think it's also an important point. Um, but, but clearly, these are all related. So the first again is is the ability to govern and audit. You need to be able to. Uh, control your training data and uh, you know understand where did it come from. Not just what was the final result, but really what was the process. I'll often uh, use that word. You need to understand the process that created your training data. Um, you know, not just this final label soup that you have, a hundred thousand labels uh, in one big set that's that has no other structure. Um, you know, behind kind of where it came from. Number two, the the need to explain your decision. So when when you do discover. Um, and, and you will always discover, I, I would say, uh, areas where your model underperforms or overperforms. You know, it's it's never homogenous. There are always uh, artifacts and surprises and clusters and slices of data where you see different performance. And being able to speak to why uh, that those differences are there is 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 very important, um, both from a liability standpoint as well as just um, often it drives to better quality when you can see why is my model behaving this way and why does my data have this uh, this property. Number three is going to be correcting biases. So, um, you know, it's it's good to try hard and not let bias in your model in the first place. Unfortunately, I'd say that's near impossible today, um, just because there are so many often unintended biases that can creep in. And so, uh, do what you can to to get the first version good. But then, um, very important is going to be that ability to iterate. And when those biases are detected, how how smoothly, how quickly, how efficiently can you address them? Number four is uh, that collaboration piece that Alex mentioned, where you need a tight feedback loop between your subject matter experts and your data scientists. You know the folks who have the knowledge about what success looks like and what the class labels mean, um, and, and that this is actually going to solve your downstream need. And those folks who are uh, you know building the models or doing the uh, you know the calculating the metrics. Um, you know if, if they're working in silos, there are so many additional uh, places where uh, problems you know can creep in, whether that's misunderstandings, misalignments. Or just you know a lack of ability to iterate, which you know as we've mentioned is so important. And then five, again, obviously related to the others, but I like this 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 idea, and I, and I know that this has resonated with a number of different folks we've talked to um, on the government side. Having a a full bill of materials, you might say, for what went into your model. Um, you know what is what is everything that I do and don't rely on. This this helps both for trustworthiness uh, in terms of you know understanding uh, around biases and things, but also trustworthiness from the standpoint of you know, uh, are, are we certain that there are no you know vectors where data poisoning could have taken place, or um, you know other sort of uh, other systems that maybe did not as carefully monitor for bias, uh, you know, creeping in or, or, or being involved in our um, in what you're building. So uh, I'll dive into these in a little bit more detail now with with a running example. Um, and again, this is all going to be predicated on this idea that if you move from this very manual process, this very implicit process, to something more explicit and measurable and inspectable programmatic labeling, that, that, that's what it really enables these benefits and, and lets these key requirements be satisfied. So um, Alex showed you some examples, some very simple examples of labeling functions, but uh, the, the key idea I want to, to show you here is, um, you know, when you're manually labeling something, uh, you know, let's say that you're, um, you know, training a, a spam classifier, you, you want to, um, uh, well, yeah, train a spam classifier. You can inspect these individual uh, emails, you know, or documents, data points, and um, you know, read read through it and figure out why you think it is spam or not spam, and then you, you have that reason, but you effectively toss that out if you're manually labeling and provide just the label. And this is um, a little bit uh, insane, um, or at least just inefficient, right? You 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 do this work, you have richer knowledge, but that's not currently used in in most uh, labeling pipelines. Instead, you kind of hope that the model can uh, relearn what you already knew, but now are hoping that it can figure out via like ten thousand questions, right? As you give it data, data, uh, new data points. With programmatic labeling, on the other hand, uh, again, you look at the data point and decide what the label should be, and then in hopefully fairly lightweight ways, uh, we have a number of different um, components in Snorkel Flow that make it easy to capture labeling rationales. You're now going to basically uh, create a labeling function, and again, the inputs to this can be fairly high level. We, we make it very, uh, you know, friendly and accessible to SMEs who who, who can't write a lick of code. Um, but the output, you know, the, the result of that is this function, which can be now uh, inspected. It, it's an intermediate artifact that makes explicit what exactly is going into the decision. 
And then these, these artifacts, these labeling functions are what actually produce your training labels. So the whole process, the, the, the training label creation process is still very much driven by the domain knowledge, driven by your expert. They're the ones saying what should be done here. This isn't a you know, lift yourself by your own bootstraps, um, you know, just have, a, have the model teach itself kind of thing. It's, it's very much expertise driven, but now with this, this intermediate step that, that comes with a bunch of the benefits that, that, uh, that I've previewed and we'll go into more detail now. Um, and just to, to, to provide a little more, you know, um, make it a little more concrete for you, you know, what is this labeling function that I'm going to sometimes refer to these quite a bit? Uh, the answer is it can be a lot of things. Um, you know, so we often use the fairly simple examples of uh, if you're doing work on a text use case, you can often kind of highlight these are the phrases or headers or uh, keywords that indicate to me that this should be a, a certain class or that this um, entity is, is the thing that I'm looking for. But that's really the, the sort of on the simplest end of the spectrum. You can do, um, I mean, basically, if you can't, if you could express it in code, then it, it can be a labeling function. So sometimes that's identifying, uh, that's, you know, that's writing out patterns or, or things that you've identified, um, you know, or, or kind of working with existing, uh, you know, attributes of your data. And sometimes it's, um, you know, wrapping existing resources. So if you have manual labels, those can be used. If you have existing models, those can be used. The important thing is that now it's not all just uh, sort of you know mixed indiscriminately in a way that 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 doesn't let you remove it. You now have uh, control when you've got these explicit labeling functions to potentially you know identify or or recognize the risk of using one of these and turn that off or see you know, the effect if it's on um, either on quality or bias or whatnot. So important in all of this, uh, I, I come back to often is just that ability to control and um, and transparently see what is and isn't being used um, you know, by your downstream system. So as a running example, um, we're going to work with uh, the uh, lending discrimination. So um, as, as with many um, uh, use cases for models, it's important and, and, and uh, explicitly illegal to rely on certain protected attributes, such as you know, race, color, religion, sex, et cetera. And, uh, and if, you, if you do violate that, then there are obviously you know, penalties, fees, reputational risk, et cetera. Um, and this may not, you know, be a, be a perfect fit for any of your use cases, but I think it, it makes for a fairly good proxy, um, which, which, which we'll use. So looking at this first key requirement that we've got, how do you govern and audit your AI uh, or ML training data? And, and the issue you've got with manual labeling is that um, you have these, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands and millions of data points. And because there is no structure behind them um, or, or sort of process that, that you can inspect for how they're made, if you need to go back and inspect them, you kind of have to inspect on this one by one level, uh, which makes it very tough, right? If, for example, in this case, we know that there are certain attributes that cannot be used, we want to see if anyone explicitly used them or referred to them. Um, you know, you, you could do maybe some searches and things, but you're 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 wading through a pool, a, a soup of labels, as I often think about it. With programmatic labeling, on the other hand, uh, I showed you you end up with this intermediate artifact, which is your labeling functions, and that's often you know in a much smaller order, on the order of maybe tens instead of uh, you know, hundreds of thousands. It's, it's, it's far more uh, palatable uh, and approachable. And you can now be comprehensive because any label in your training set was produced by these labeling functions. And so um, you, know, you can identify, are we explicitly referencing any of those forbidden attributes? This doesn't handle the potential for implicit bias. We'll talk about that in a couple slides, but on the explicit side, any sort of inspection that you wanna do um, uh, around the labeling process, you can now do in you know one sitting rather than sort of a, a, a you know weeks long or months long effort of reinspecting all your individual data points. Uh, next, how do you explain outputs and errors? So uh, on the manual labeling side, um, and uh, you know this has been mentioned before, uh, it, it's it's not enough to just say, well, I didn't I didn't you know uh, factor in race or gender um, explicitly. It, it's entirely possible that you know. Um, the, the name or the address or other properties, you know, do, do bias labelers uh, decisions. We've seen this, I know there've been some uh, interesting and somewhat sad studies showing that, you know, on resumes, even just changing the name to appear to be a different race can, can alter how a qualified a candidate seems. And so, um, you know, this is, this is tough when your labeling process happens in, in, the, in the head of your labelers and you don't know what is and isn't factoring in. You don't know uh, what is affecting their decision here. And they may not even know themselves, right? These can be truly implicit biases that arise. And again, that, that benefit we get from programmatic labeling is the explicitness of it all. 
the fact that now, um, you know, as your labelers come to their conclusion, they have to codify explicitly, like, this is what I'm basing my decision on. And in that process, they'll either, you know, recognize that maybe implicit bias is at play and can correct it then, or at the very least, you now have the ability to, to go back and identify, um, you know, where, uh, what, what is and isn't contributing to the label for a specific example, or, um, you know, what, what's affecting your model's performance on, on specific data points based on which labeling functions uh, are, are labeling examples like that one and therefore affecting your training set in that mode. Number three uh, is how to detect and eliminate bias. Uh, as I mentioned, it's um, uh, you, you detect as much as you, well, you, sorry, you try and prevent as much as you can, but uh, inevitably, you know, in any model that's deployed long-term, you know, that has a life cycle, which increasingly, you know, models do, I'd say in real world use cases um, where they're replacing sort of online systems, um, you need to monitor. We saw that actually specified by one of those executive orders as well. The need to, to observe is is uh, performance changing um, uh, over time and on different subsets or, or or even just overall quality going down. And so, um, you know, when you do detect um, changes, when you do detect potentially you know bias, and you want to correct it, how do you do that? And uh, Alex mentioned a little bit the futility of of trying to to modify individual data points to improve things. Um, and, and even if modifying a few data points can make the difference, I'd say it's still um, feels a little bit like whack-a-mole as you try to, you know, modify enough data to make a difference or, or hope that your, you know, these, these 10 or 100 that you've changed in your, in your bigger label soup is enough for your model to, to figure out what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and, and often that's, that's even that much is not necessarily doable. And, um, you know, you end up effectively having to relabel from scratch. And that's, that's particularly painful because the economics of manual labeling are such that uh, every label requires um, about the same amount of human time uh, to, to perform. And so um, you end up uh, paying the same cost for your first label as your, as your thousandth label, as your millionth label. And then you pay that same cost a second time and a third time and a fourth time every time that you need to update your training set. And uh, the only way to, to you know, redo that manual process is to, again, you know, run that manual process. And you can contrast this with the programmatic labeling approach where because you've, you've invested in capturing domain knowledge into functions which can now be executed and your hundreds of thousands of training labels are generated by functions and a functional process, when you need to make a change, you can change a relatively small number, maybe, you know, sometimes even just a, a couple of labeling functions if they're the ones that you've identified or you, know, you can do those experiments and systematically identify what is contributing to this bias downstream. And when you make those changes, you can then push that you know, re-execute button and relabel your training set in an embarrassingly parallel way uh, extremely quickly you know, often seconds or minutes, you've, you've regenerated a fresh set of training labels that no longer have that source um, or, or are using the updated version you know, of it. And, um, and then you're you know, off to the races. So I think especially for, for applications where you're not just trying to prove the concept, can AI work once, you know, can AI work for us once here, but rather, you know, we, we plan on using machine learning here long-term. You know, we, we, this is our, our new system, um, or this is the direction that we're headed as an organization. Um, because of the various benefits of AI, recognizing that um, you need to factor in not just the first model training, but all the subsequent ones as well. And do you have a scalable process for that, um, both for the scale reasons as well as um, you know the fact that you're going to need to do that um, to deal with the types of uh, you know, biases that you detect and need, need to address. Uh, fourth, supporting the tight, free tight feedback loop between SMEs and data scientists. On, on the manual labeling side, um, I've seen this uh, time and time again with, with different um, companies and organizations that we've collaborated with. Uh, they feel like they can never get enough subject matter expert time. And, uh, and often the only interface that they can really use is to ask for more labels or ask for labels on these specific examples. But because that, that labeling process is very slow, um, because it's manual, that, that makes for very rough, very you know, loose feedback cycles and just reduces the number of times that these, these teams can, can iterate. because you've got an interface that's just uh, inherently not very suitable for this. And on the other hand, with programmatic labeling, you get this, this virtual virtuous cycle of, of improvement where um, your subject matter experts have captured their knowledge in functions where now the data scientists can answer a lot of their own questions, fortunately, by inspecting what was captured, as well as you know, when, they, when they have ideas for new things or when they have um, you know, questions to, to ask or, or clarify, there's, there's a much more efficient interface, a new labeling function or an updated comment on a labeling function and how it needs to change rather than just, again, that label soup.
And that, you know, of course, then ends up being a much faster process for making updates or clarifying uh, these types of things. And then finally, supply chain integrity. Um, when you're manually labeling, um, that, that because that is so painful, we've you know, observed um, some some people reaching for, you know, isn't there just a pre-trained model somewhere that I could use that's 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 good enough? And I'd say, you know, often there is somewhat of an element of settling there because, um, you know, pre-trained models uh, have had some uh, surprisingly, uh, you know, pretty cool um, uh, you cherry picked demos. It's, it's exciting, but typically when you go and apply this to your problem, uh, it doesn't. And then how could it have the nuance that you have in your head of your problem? You know, your specific class def definitions, or um, or just the expertise on your domain, where something that's been trained with general purpose knowledge isn't going to be ready for that. So um, there's both the the you know performance questions, but then separately and in addi addition, I, again, you don't know what what training data went into that model or what process was used there. And, and odds are it was a manual process where, again, you have these same issues of not knowing what implicitly was, was being factored in there. And with programmatic labeling, uh, you get that bill of materials. As I like to think of it, where now you know, every source of supervision that goes in, you can uh, you know, inspect, identify. Um, you, can, you can still use those pre-trained models. That's something we've seen be effective often is they do have signal. It's not, it's not useless. Um, but but you now can you know you you have control over you know um, what is and isn't used and um, you can identify is this contributing to negative effects or you know is this part of the problem here and if you identify that it is you can remove it and if you identify that it's not you can you can keep those free points that it's potentially giving you as you apply that to your problem. So in summary, um, you know trustworthy AI. I, I outlined a number of these key uh, you know principles or objectives requirements that 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 should be satisfied that can be satisfied, but hopefully, you know, you've walked away from this um, talk today understanding that, um, you know, manual labeling this, this approach we've used for, for decades to, to feed these models uh, simply isn't up to the task now as AI is becoming increasingly operationalized, moved out of the lab and into the real world where um, trustworthiness now matters at a level that it never did. Um, scalability now, you know, is, is increasing in people's minds and not just, um, you know, pure quantity, but but a scalable approach and AI strategy as a whole for an organization to, um, you know, uh, deploy AI solutions in a way that is uh, responsible and effective. So uh, this talk today, you know, fairly high level, obviously focused on the trust for the AI aspects. I, I would recommend uh, if you'd like to see this in a little more uh, technical detail, we do have public demos periodically. And we've got another one coming up uh, on the 27th where you can um, register and, and see us walk through a sample task and, and get a little more intuition there. And then if you have any other questions, um, feel free to follow up with our, our federal team at federalsnorkel.ai. So with that, happy to take some questions. Thank you, Braden. Yes, we do have a few questions for you. Um, the first one is, can my subject matter experts still write labeling functions even if they can't code? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we talk about how this provides source code, um, you know, or functions, but um, that, that shouldn't uh, scare SMEs. We've seen it be very effectively used this approach by them because you can put all sorts of higher level interfaces on top of uh, uh, labeling functions where you can say, hey, if you're writing you know, keyword based LFs, you just highlight the keyword. You just give me that list of keywords or you, you, know, you point to the document where it's relevant and then we can kind of you know, compile that input down into a function that, that handles that boilerplate code of you know, searching over a document, looking for that keyword and returning the right label. Um, so, you know, in Snorkel Flow, we provide a whole bunch of different templates, dozens and dozens, um, based on observed usage of the ways that experts will want to express their, their labeling decisions. Um, and and uh, you can see some of those in the demo, actually, if you come to that uh, next week. Um, I think we also have some screenshots on our website showing um, a whole zoo of LF templates from those very simple keyword-based things to embedding-based approaches or wrapping models or, or labels or, or different things like that. Great, and that public demo is on the 27th of April? That's right, yep, and uh, here's the, the link um, if you want to find that registration. Out of curiosity, what time? Uh, we should check the link to confirm. Okay, what is the okay. <laughs> right. yeah, it's all good. Okay, uh, next question is, if I can label my data points program, program, programmatically, sorry, then why do I need a classifier? Yeah, um, this is a very common FAQ. And I'm, I'm glad people ask it because it shows they're um, engaging and thinking through this. Because yeah, it's, it's a fair question, right? If I've, if, you know, a, a, a training label you've created looks a lot like a prediction and, and it's, it's fair to wonder, am I basically just building a rule-based system, right? Are expert systems coming back? Is, 
is, is what's old become new again. Um, and I actually may have a slide here. Yeah, um, in the appendix to show this. Um, but basically now with, with programmatic labeling, you sort of get the best of both worlds where your inputs are these rules, which we've said have a bunch of benefits, the inspectability and reproducibility and you know, the ability to re-execute, et cetera. But your labeling functions you know, typically aren't full classifiers. You know, it, um, it, the fact that something simple or you know, can weakly label a portion of your data set is often a reflection of the fact that it's focusing on some very specific subset of your data rather than having a full nuance of the full decision space. So you get these labeling functions and have them label portions of your data set. And sometimes they'll agree and sometimes they'll disagree. We then you know, model, I think Alex showed some, some of the uh, you know, basic outline of, of the machine learning problem here, but we can basically learn confidence weighted training labels for you know, some portion of your data from this, because rarely can you actually enumerate uh, you know, rules to cover 100% of your data. And then this training set becomes um, something you can use to train a model, which now can generalize beyond your rules. So you know, a model, an NL model, can take advantage of a much richer feature set, you know, distributed and learned representations, word embeddings, transfer learning, all sorts of nice things, um, you know, reasons why machine learning is doing so well on so many tasks today, because it does have uh, an incredible amount of power to draw on, um, but it needs those training labels. So um, there's, a, there's, there's more that could be discussed here, and, and here's actually a blog post that goes into a little more detail there, but essentially your, your rules are used to create the training set um, using a relatively small number of features that you can use to directionally guide those training labels, but then your model takes advantage of, of a lot richer space of, of features, learning, you know, not just using those um, specific things that you've enumerated in, in your rules, but rather all the trends that are being sort of, that are present in your, in your training set. Great, thank you so much, Braden. We really appreciate your talk and uh, thank you for taking some questions. Of course. Wonderful. Okay. Um, Next, we have um, a panel coming up. So uh, joining us for today's panel, we have an array of subject matter experts from across academia, technology, finance, and government. Our panelists today are Tom Sasala, the Chief Data Officer of the Department of Navy, uh, Swati Gupta, Focus Family Early Career pr Professor and Lead of Ethics AI at Georgia Tech, um, Sakashi Jen, the Senior Manager for Responsible AI Equity and In Explainability at LinkedIn, and Skip McCormick, Data Science Fellow at BNY Mellon. Welcome all, how are you today? Thank you. I think we can see you all, you're all here. Okay, lovely. Um, well, I'm gonna give you all an opportunity to introduce yourself briefly, um, and then I will have you answer a question that you'll all be going through. So that question is, why is trustworthy AI important for your industry or field? And what steps are your organizations taking to address it? So we'll, we will go in the order of um, Tom, Swati, Sakshi, and then Skip. All right, awesome. Can, hopefully you can hear me, Alexis. Everything good? We got right, you, yes. Awesome. Um, so, <clears throat> so obviously uh, in the Department of Defense, we have a lot of mission requirements that require trustworthy decision-making writ large, right? Uh, so we're looking at AI across a broad spectrum of support functions as well as autonomous sort of functions. The uh, most important thing that we're kind of narrowing in on is kind of, and I know we'll address this kind of in the second half of the question here, uh, but really around that ethical use of AI and what do we really want to trust uh, some sort of machine learning or artificial intelligence type infrastructure to assist a human with or uh, maybe even potentially replace a human. And so in terms of trustworthiness, it really comes down to not only the algorithms itself, but the data that we're feeding the algorithms and the speed in which uh, we can get the models trained in a way that we feel comfortable that the 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 recommendations or the sort of battle management aids as we call them are available to the commanders and in, in, in the sort of decision makers in a way that is timely uh, against the targets that we're prosecuting and so it becomes very super complicated when you move beyond something as and i'm going to put this in air quotes right as simple as sort of autonomous vehicles because that's not even remotely um simple per se but if you're using some sort of uh machine augmented decision making for kinetic targeting specifically where we're going to engage in some sort of activity that might result in some sort of lethality uh there's a lot of strings attached to that and so we're really trying to address this across the broad uh, waterfront and so we've kind of broken our uh, AI, I'm gonna I'm gonna call it infrastructure. That that's a loose term, right? But the way in which we're approaching AI is kind of broken up into a couple 
big buckets because of this. So there was really that uh, war fighting application of AI in terms of um, uh, battle management aids and human assisted decision making. Uh, then there's the uh, what we're calling the unmanned vehicle sort of portion of AI, which is really uh, navigating uh, uh, in, the, in the open waters or in the air or, or subsurface uh, using some sort of autonomous vehicles, right? And then the third part is really uh, more what I'm involved with on a day-to-day -day basis, which is that kind of prescriptive and predi predictive sort of analytics uh, using more of the business data that it's uh, really approached in terms of the uh, the, the, the kind of uh, the help our senior leaders understand the, the space that we're in from an operations perspective and from a business management perspective and give them those insights that maybe they haven't had in the past uh, and maybe that they maybe they want to answer some very specific specific questions. And so we are we have established enterprise data environment to enable that capability. Uh, we are looking right now to how do we encapsulate some sort of the basic infrastructure from an AI perspective um, and use AI as an enabler. Uh, and so through on the Navy side, uh, we we have the navigation implementation plan, navigation plan implementation framework uh, that has uh, AI as a core enabler to a lot of the other NIF objectives. And then on the Marine Corps side, we're also looking uh, in conjunction with some of the other land force capabilities, aka the Army, right, uh, how we can enable AI for a variety of different purposes, um, mostly for that uh, kind of um, uh, engagement capability, but also in terms of force support, if you consider, uh, you know, just simple things like, uh, you know, translation of voice translation from different languages into other languages, right, that kind of a st uh, Star trek -y sort of universal translator sort of thing is something that is really uh, uh, important whenever you're doing uh, force protection and when you're doing some sort of a uh, cleanup after some sort of uh, some sort of activity that we have on going on. So hopefully uh, that addresses the question. Yeah, thank you so much, Tom. And yes, that cross functionality is um, really key. Uh, worked closely uh, with the Navy at, at when I was at the Army looking at something similar. Um, so Swati, if you could answer the same question. So hi, everyone. I'm uh, Swati Gupta. I'm an assistant professor and Fouts Family Early Career Professor at Georgia Tech. And I also serve as the lead of Ethical AI for a recently awarded NSFAI Institute. Um, uh, since 2021, I have a PhD in OR from MIT. And my research interests are in machine learning, optimization, and algorithmic fairness. And uh, my work cuts across various domains, such as e-commerce, quantum optimization, energy. And I, I think about ethics in every algorithm that I come across. And so to answer the question, uh, you know, coming from an optimization machine learning background, you know, we, uh, I guess, as a field, you know, we are interested in uh, understanding as algorithms are becoming more pervasive, uh, what is the impact of algorithms on the well-being of people? And uh, particularly, you know, uh, research-wise sort of developing cutting-edge algorithms and technologies to understand, uh, you know, what is fair, what is biased, how can we have transparency in algorithms, how can we incorporate ethics, you know, maybe some things that are legally driven or policy driven, and I will talk about that a little bit later as well, and how do we make machine learning and optimization algorithms accountable, especially those that interact in the society. Uh, specifically at Georgia Tech, you know, we encourage a lot of interdisciplinary research, and uh, in these areas of, uh, you know, short form as fate. Uh, we specifically encourage cross-cutting uh, uh, research with law and public policy uh, people uh, along with optimization machine learning and people working in various applications. Uh, we uh, really, I really do believe that it's important to understand the legal landscape that we're operating in and tailor our algorithms and, and find new questions to even solve because of the changing landscape. Uh, the next thing that I would think uh, that I would say is sort of one of the uh, uh, Again, one of the main uh, uh, things that we're doing in our organization is teaching course development, teaching students, teaching, um, uh, you know, uh, students at undergrad level, at graduate level, even at uh, K to 12 level to think about bias and algorithms and uh, understand, you know, just from the grassroots level, understand what does it mean to solve an optimization problem that is not biased? Like, what does it mean to look at numbers and not just make decisions based on numbers, but really know, you know, there is some uncertainty or some social context behind these. So we are really trying to develop new courses that can incorporate ethics uh, as, uh, you know, in the basics of machine learning and AI itself. And uh, with that, uh, at the 
at the NSFA Institute itself, uh, we are doing internal audits for all projects, internal ethical audits for all projects to make sure that we are policy compliant to even understand what an ethical framework would look like and what ethics and design questions could look like. We want to train students to be able to ask dependent on the application that they're working in and really go beyond IRB protocols, which are set for human uh, behavioral research, but really go beyond those and understand what are, you know, what are our well-being metrics that need to be incorporated in technology in from from design and not just as an afterthought. That's uh, maybe a long answer no, to a short question. Absolutely a very important answer. Um, education is definitely critical, especially as we think about the next generation when it comes to building AI ML applications ethically. Um, so Sakshi, on to you. Um, hi all, um, and it has been so exciting to hear all these uh, responses from different areas. So I'm Sakshi, uh, I work at LinkedIn. I lead the responsibility AI efforts here. Um, and so my team focuses on making systems fair, making systems equitable, explainable, trustworthy, um, all of those terms here that we used. Um, before this, I was working for seven years in anti-abuse, uh, which is also broadly a part of trust, uh, where I was protecting, we were working on protecting LinkedIn from malicious activity that's happening on the set. So um, I've been in and around the space for very long, and I feel passionately about uh, moving and uplifting the the historically marginalized group, especially uh, on this platform. So uh, your question as to why is this important uh, for the space? One uh, is LinkedIn is one of the largest social network professionally for um, out there. And every day, literally millions of members are connecting with opportunities like connecting with the right person, right connection, uh, right job, applying to the right job, and like, you know, being informed on the platform. So, and we all understand that profession, your professional growth plays a big role in your well-being of yourself and people around you. So, like, it was no questions asked. Like, of course, we have to think about uh, what it means to be ethical and transparent. Uh, not, it's not just a unique, unique position and opportunity, but also responsibility we feel towards our members. So on that front, uh, LinkedIn has been investing quite significantly in uh, deeply understanding all the different aspects of responsible AI. Um, I generally tend to talk more about uh, the equity and fairness, which I feel is super difficult. Um, so we we are focusing on understanding how so like historically societal biases can make their way into a system like LinkedIn, which is huge um, and it is complex and nuanced to say the least. Um, like just to give a few examples, like we we know that humans are biased. Humans can be biased, and they they make data, and like our models potentially be learning those biases. But beyond that, there are so many other ways it can make way. And one is maybe a product experience is actually not as suitable for one group as the other, um, which you may not even realize. Maybe members of different segments actually behave differently, and it just appears as biased when you start to measure it. Right? We know that, for example, females do not tend to self-promote themselves as much, and so when you look at data, it may just appear like, oh, are we being biased if females are not filling up their profile as much? So it is like it's a it's not just a technical problem; it's a social technical problem, which we I, like everyone here understands and identifying the right solution, uh, curating it has to be very carefully done because it's very easy to also solve the wrong problem here. Um, so two things which I think would stand out where I feel has been super helpful in LinkedIn is one is the operating model. Um, since we're all practitioners here, uh, you would understand that fairness, equity, especially uh, it can be quite inefficient having to draw alignment across all the different business verticals on the space. So I think operating model is a key here. And LinkedIn has a, uh, it has a very largely cross-functional team across policy experts, lawyers, engineers, AI specialists, designers, et cetera, who work with the executive team centrally um, and to identify, first of all, what principles we stand behind because like it, it, we have to answer that question to know what to solve and then operationalize and like launch it across all the different verticals. Um, as Greg mentioned, I think on the ethics council and more like IRB, uh, we have something similar in the company to like to understand how the different experiments are actually impacting the ethical side of it. Um, that's one. The other piece that we've been doing is actually asking members to volunteer the information on race, ethnicity, gender. Uh, this is quite a bold move, I think, on behalf of a company. And I think I don't know of many companies who do that. But the motivation behind this is really if you want to know how big the bias is, 
if you want to measure it, we, we need this data to understand and investigate. It is really easy to say, we can't measure, so we don't know, so we won't solve, right? Like it's really easy to do that, but it's very hard to actually convince our members, ask this information and do like build systems that can in a privacy preserving manner, allow us to draw insights. So that's something we're really proud of. And thirdly, uh, we are trying to share our challenges and learnings more openly with the, with the industry. Uh, through open source tools because we want feedback. We want to know how others are solving it because it's not easy to begin with. But um, these are some of the things we have been doing uh, broadly in the responsible AI space. Thank you so much. Yes, I was really curious to hear about that one because we use LinkedIn every day. Um, you know, Snorkel is you know growing and hiring like crazy. I know uh, Greg mentioned that in his talk too, and, and we use the LinkedIn tool uh, quite a bit. So thank you so much for what you do. And uh, Skip, let's bring us home on this question. Yeah. Sure. Happy to. So so uh, we're talking about trustworthiness, and that means we really need to understand what do we mean by trust. So if you like Google it, you'll get you'll get it's a, a firm belief in reliability, truth, ability, or strength, right? And in a financial context, uh, where I come from, Bank of New York Mellon, it, a trust is also an arrangement where one party holds the property of, of another uh, party for the nominal good of the beneficiaries, right? That That's the classic uh, trust instrument. Trust is also a verb, right? And, and it has it's related to having faith in someone or something. In 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 uh, Bank of New York Mellon, trust is essential in all of those ways. In in every decision we make, every recommendation or action we take, and every responsibility that we assume. So our use of AI has to augment the trust that uh, BNY has earned over almost three centuries of service. Right. This is because ultimately every decision is a human decision. Right. It's owned by the human who made the decision. Uh, we want to make it to the best of their abilities based on the most comprehensive basis and, and uh, understanding we can employ. But um, our AI and ML techniques, they have to stand up to the same standards of trust that, that the human has to stand up to in a marketplace where trust is everything, right? So at BNY Mellon, our objective is to use AI and ML to arm our clients and employees with superior uh, intelligence and foresight. So those methods have to be reliable and verifiable and sound. This is another way of saying that our AI, AI and ML must be worthy of trust uh, by the human beings who look to them for insight and anything less is actually useless. So where machine learning uh, provides amazing scale and coverage that exceeds human you know, power, in the end, it's still probabilistic and requires expert human judgment at the decision and action stage. And this is where the responsibility is personal, 100% human. And the trustworthy systems are better systems. They produce better results, right? So um, trust is the foundation. Our users require reliable trust-based metrics. Uh, we, we have a class of metadata we call FEAT, fairness, ethics, uh, accountability, and transparency. These are meta models that we use to measure all of our models so that the decision makers who want to use the outputs of the models can, can make a decision in uh, in the appropriate way based upon the, the appropriate uh, reliability and application of what the model is telling them. So ultimately, we have to own the decisions we make personally and corporately, not the computer. Trustworthy people require trustworthy tools. And um, my dad was a bit of a carpenter, and he always said um, amateur carpenters blame their tools or the wood. The pros take full responsibility. The same principle applies to a data scientist, right? The data is the data. You create the models. You're responsible for the output and you can't blame it on the model or the data. The responsibility falls to you. And so, um, so you know, bringing it back to Snorkel, um, one of the key parts of Trust the Models is do you really understand the input of your data? Were you able to um, keep up with the training, right? If that process is too big for humans to deal with, how do you know? Right. If you have automated processes, which is what I like about Snorkel, you can you can quickly retrain your models on updated tagged information as frequently as you need to based upon those metrics that that are telling you um, how reliable your model is. 
Thank you, Skip. And yes, that traceability back to the individual that wrote the labeling function is really one of those key cornerstones of Snorkel Flows technology. So uh, thank you for, for pointing that out. Thank you, Skip. And Skip, I have to say that we, we've all been admiring your background as well. Oh. <laughs> Um, so after this, thank you guys all for answering that question. Um, we're going to ask each of you an individual question. So I'm going to start with Tom. Uh, how, so Tom, uh, how do you think about incorporating ethics and responsibility into an enterprise data architecture for the Navy? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And and I realize, I guess I failed to really introduce myself during the first time. So maybe it's fair to say Tom Sasele, Chief Data Officer for the Department of the Navy. Um, and just a interest, a point of uh, clarification, the Department of the Navy is comprised of the U.S. Navy and the U.S. Marine Corps. So a lot of people just say the Navy, right, uh, when in fact that is more than one thing. So that actually introduces a lot of complications into our naval data architecture. And I say naval meaning the Secretariat, the U.S. Navy and U.S. Marine Corps, right? Uh, and I see Skip nodding his head there. So I remember from uh, my prior life in a different community. Um, but I have been twiddling with those knobs in the background since I sat down. So I just want to say that's awesome. Um, so, uh, you know, it's really hard from an architecture perspective to actually say how we want to embed a lot of this into her. So what we're trying to do is we're trying, uh, and this is a little bit of a riff on the Navy theme, it's called buoys, not barriers, right? Um, and so we want to put up the kind of barriers left and right and allow people to navigate down the channel channel in a safe environment if they choose to deviate from that kind of boundaries that we've established in our architecture and in our policies procedures governance and some of the other things uh, then they're kind of doing so at their own risk and so what we're asking people to do is just to be honest with themselves and be honest with us when they want to leave the channel when they want to they want to go over one of those barriers just let us know uh, we're here to help um, but we want to make that make sure that they know that the those those challenges are that they're going to face because they're outside of that kind of that that normalness is, is going to be there. And so from an architecture perspective, um, we're trying to establish controls that allow and I'm going to use this in a very loose term and I, and I really appreciate Skip defining trustworthiness, but the ethical use of data is a matter of, of, of subjectiveness on a, a lot of different fronts, right? So uh, we're trying to put controls in, in place that allow people to have access to as much data as they need, right, without necessarily giving them access to everything that they may might not need. And so typically when people get access to things uh, that they were not normally afforded to, they have a tendency to, you know, misuse or misappropriate some of that 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 stuff. And so, uh, in this case, uh, you know, we do restrict uh, health data. We do restrict uh, personally identifiable information. We have laws around how we need to, you know, handle and, and control that. Those laws kind of apply broadly across companies as well as the public sector. In my case, the Department of the Navy, right? Um, but there's also classified information and sensitive source information that we need to make sure that we control as well. Uh, and so, uh, we do have different tiers in terms of the traditional sort of DOD classification uh, mechanisms that we tier those people when you have to have a security clearance to get access to that data, right? And then we also try to enforce to the extent that we can is this, this notion of need to know and so um, way back after 9-11, we did try to pivot from this need to know to the responsibility to provide. Um, and we're and I'm really trying to kind of push that model as well. And so all the data will be available for use. Uh, but the other thing that we want to talk about in terms of ethical use, and I just want to point this out, is um, we kind of intrinsically want to trust that the people that have access to the data are going to use it appropriately. So there's a cautionary tale when you log into the system that says that you're being monitored. Um, and so we are monitoring their use and their activity. And if we see something that's out of bounds, uh, that triggers a sort of a series of questions and maybe even potentially actions. Um, some of them might be positive, some of them might be adverse, right? Uh, but so we want to really just trust people and not uh, the other the other big thing we're trying to do in the DoD, which is countercultural, is not pre-assume the use of the data once it's been created, right? And so a lot of times data will get created for a mission, um, and people think that data can only be used for that mission. Um, I use this example when I was in the intelligence community. The information we're gathering, gathering when you badge in and out of the building, can be used for a lot more than whether or not you are at work or not at work. Right? Um, it, it could be used, uh, you know, just from a health safety perspective. If there's a fire drill, are you still in the building? You're not in the building, right? It could be used for 
auditing your time card. Did you actually show up to work or not show up to work, right? Or, or it could be, you know, used for some sort of anomalous behavior detection. Are you coming to work at 2 a.m. when you don't normally come to work at 2 a.m.? Um, and it, does that align to some sort of organizational or geographical event that were necessitated you to be there. And so there's lots of different uses of that data. So um, we're trying to bake that into our architecture. And so um, I would just say there's different um, services that we're trying to offer and different algorithms we're trying to put into place to maximize the use of the data, but also kind of flag uh, what I would say is, I don't want to say inappropriate use of data, but maybe questionable use of data that might be some sort of ethical quandary. Um, because as we're, we're starting to see now on the business side, as we have integrated human capital data, we've integrated FM data, financial management data, uh, we've integrated some what we call our uh, logistics and sustainment data, which is really our materials, like how much we have of what uh, and where it is in the world. As we integrate that with some other more operational concerns, right, um, you know, people can really start to divine a lot of interesting things about what the Navy is intending to do by where we're moving supply, uh, by the types of money we're spending on what types of material and that kind of stuff. So those integration points and those dashboards um, at that highest level, which, which I'm operating at because I work directly for the Undersecretary and the Secretary of the Navy, um, to give them a holistic view of the Department of the Navy, uh, who actually gets to see these dashboards and at what level do you granulate uh, these dashboards? And so we're struggling with that a little bit, um, you know, that balance of giving access to data, giving access to analytics, um, empowering people with tools to do the analytics. I think it was Sakshi said something about, you know, allowing people to do that work. And and the previous speaker talked about, you know, the, the algorithm's the easy part. Absolutely. Um, the model is actually the easiest part. Getting them the data and getting them access to the data in the DoD is by far the largest barrier. Um, and then the second largest barrier is getting clean, curated data that is complete and trustworthy, right? Um, that we can trust that we can use it for some sort of decision. Um, my challenge is to take that to the next step and look over the horizon and say, well, what decision did we use that data for? And if the data comes into question later on, can we go back and trace it back to that decision, right? And and then maybe revisit the decision or not. Uh, and so that revision recall is a huge problem for us. And, and that's really an operational concern you know, again, in former lives, we had other concerns around some of the data. And I certainly I appreciate the, the, the kind of perspectives from Swati and Sakchi. Being from the private sector, that may or may not be a question for them. I don't know. Um, but, you know, as we kind of move from that defensive data analytics work into the offensive data analytics work and how do we use the data to drive our business and our operations, um, it's really an open question right now in terms of, I don't think it's an architecture question. I think it's a governance and a procedure question, but certainly architecturally, we have definitely put in controls in place technologically. Um, automated, I might add, because that's the other thing is uh, the data moves faster than humans, right? Um, so we need to automate all that and then uh, fine tune it. And the last thing I'll just mention is we are auditing our auditing, if you will. Um, so we're actually trying to audit how well our decision making on the use of the data is to see if we need to tweak that decision making algorithm right um, and so that's actually it, it's really hard to think of the data creates data that also is data uh, and so that management of that becomes very hard um, so with that I'll just I'll pass it back to you modern problems require modern solutions don't they and that's I think right. we, yeah, we can absolutely. all uh, relate to Skip as he was doing you hit it on the nose there um, and and I completely agree um, Swati next is for you how much of your or much of your research focuses on algorithmic fairness uh, how do we build algorithms that are fair if people can't always agree on what fair is that's an excellent question, Alexis. Um, so I just want to start with saying that, you know, the point of machine learning and AI is to discriminate. It is to discriminate. It is to, uh, you know, create positive and false labels. And it is, it is, uh, so what, so first we need to address, you know, what is bias in data? And I think this has been said earlier, but let me just use one of the definitions from a Nature article of a few years back that I really like, that bias is when scientific or technological decisions are based on a narrow set of systemic, structural, or social norms and concepts, and the resulting technology can privilege certain groups and harm others. So understanding the different parts of this definition makes the notion of fairness really relevant to the application that we are considering it under, right? What is the application that we want to define a notion of fairness for? And uh, in on that note, uh, you know, I had a few thoughts that I will quickly share because I know we are running out of time. Uh, so the first one is, you know, if you want to mitigate the impact of historical biases in an application, and that is something that Sakshi also mentioned, 
question that, you know, maybe I want to give more uh, visibility to people who have traditionally not been very visible on uh, social platforms such as LinkedIn. So when considering machine learning pipelines, you know, we want to, let's say, give loans to uh, uh, historically disadvantaged groups such as Latinos and African-Americans who have not been given very good uh, interest rates in the past. So that's good. Good. So the second thing that can guide what a notion of fairness is, is maybe the reflection of values of an organization. And uh, for instance, is inclusivity a value? And, you know, for certain things, for certain applications, even the identification of values may not be enough. So, for instance, in uh, organ transplantation organizations in the U.S., the uh, directive from national policies is to have efficiency and fairness in the way the organs are, transpl are, are allocated. And that uh, determines the prioritization of these organ uh, uh, of kidney transplant, kidney donors and uh, kidney recipients. Uh, the values are efficiency and fairness. So do we prioritize the number of lives saved or the quality in life years or the demographics which are getting the kidneys or the uh, representation of blood types? Uh, you know, so what is so one can and one can get to trade offs even when the values are a little bit clearer in an organization. And one thing that, you know, we've been trying to do is generate portfolios or generate uh, portfolios of possible solutions, small number of portfolios of possible solutions that can then be audited by stakeholders, policymakers and lawyers, and they can debate on which one is a better solution. And this is not something that, you know, we should just try to solve algorithmically. The next point is, you know, sometimes when uh, applications are forward looking, then propagating the impacts up to uh, many years forward can help us identify what are the values. For instance, if freelancers and gig economy continue to be ranked on the basis of user reviews, which are known to be biased, we are ultimately rejecting these users from the platforms and maybe you want to fix that. The other points I had were sensitivity to noise, you know, maybe in expectation we are doing pretty well, but overall the burden of noise in the data is uh, uh, incurred by certain group. Um, one concrete example that I want to maybe uh, explore here is engagement with stakeholders to understand what people care about. Consider a resume screening AI algorithm. Do people care about, you know, impact in terms of false negatives when predicting hireability or do they care about getting the top talent? And this is obviously from an organization and applicant view. So Brandon, for instance, also mentioned, you know, changing the names of resumes from Jennifer to John increase the number of offers for postdocs. And this was a study that was done a few years back. But here, law can basically help us define what to do when there are these competing objectives. You know, you, you, we need organizations to work, so prioritizing talent is important and incentivizing people to have more talent is important, but also, uh, you know, the, the notion of inclusivity or, you know, legally anti-discrimination laws uh, have disallowed a host of hiring and promotion practices that operate as built-in headwinds for minority groups. But looking at the law and policy directives, uh, you know, we 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 worked with the lawyers to understand what can an AI system actually do to be able to screen resumes that have some more representation. And, and really the the solution that came out of it was to be transparent about uncertainties in different parts of the model and account for those when selecting people. So give people the benefit of the doubt and use that as a measure of uh, increasing as a potential lever to increase diversity in the hires. Last point, and then I'll stop, is uh, recognizing that decisions build on top of decisions. So it's it's really trying to, we are trying to understand uh, a pipeline of decisions in a machine learning model that also interact with society and feedback from the users. And there might be a societal mechanism such as admissions uh, that takes in all this data. And so really uh, uh, trying to um, audit the pipeline at the different junctures is important to understand the dependencies and ultimately come up with the notion of fairness, even something that could be at different levels, but then ultimately it works towards making the entire system uh, much more ethical. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you so much, Vati. That's a really great use cases that you walked us through there. Thank you. Uh, Sakshi, the next question is for you. What approaches are you taking to make, make the use of AI at LinkedIn more equitable, uh, privacy sensitive and explainable? Um, thank you for that question. And I love that Swati covered so many of the hiring use cases um, to motivate the problem. So thank you for that. Um, so in um, we, we have some efforts and I'll touch a little bit on each fairness, privacy and explainability, but there is a lot of cross pollination, as you can understand. Um, in fairness, as a central team, one of the things that we're trying to move towards is how do we make it super simple for modelers to be 
uh, to build responsible AI. And I think Greg touched upon this, which I made a note is like, oh, they can build a model today in an afternoon. But when we ask them to build a model, which is equitable, it takes so long and it starts with literature review. So that's that's actually like towards our goal. We want our vision is to move to a place where modelers, when they train the model, there is an automated monitoring system for bias. And if the bias is found, um, then they can automatically slap on a more modular framework for mitigation. Now, this is our vision. And of course, there are so many challenges. And to begin with, one of them is what is the definition of fairness and what is a mitigation solution that you would apply? And we all understand that like this in academia, even otherwise, like there is no one definition of fairness that we all agree on. So the way we are going ahead is like creating a small suite of definitions and a corresponding mitigation solution in this larger framework that modelers use. Um, and I just want to give maybe one or two examples of why like fairness, ex fairness cases that look very different. So on LinkedIn, when you get recommendation of you may want to connect with this person, it is a two sided marketplace. So we have to think about fairness, not only on the attributes of someone who is being recommended, but also on the attributes to whom it is being recommended. So now, how do these two systems interact with each other for a fairness notion? That's one. Um, second is on content moderation. So we take down content which do not uh, comply by our policy. And with everything that's going on in the world, it is so easy for the models to learn something which is directly attributing to a, to a gender or a protected attribute to a race. And it may just learn that when actually taking down a content. So how can we evaluate our models to ensure that with this, the same post would have the same action from our models if all the context was same except for maybe the gender of the content subject? Like, can we can we say that and claim that? So, and these two problems look so different, and so we have to figure out like what is the suite of uh, measurements and monitoring solutions and mitigation. The other place where AI gets used is um, a lot of like our clients and partners they want to actually have a more diverse slate. And how do we do that without like in a creative way such that you're not actually putting someone less qualified above someone more qualified and yet give the, like and give them a diverse slate? It's a very complicated question without thinking about like affirmative action discrimination. How do we ensure all of that and do it cleanly? That's the other direction we're thinking about. Um, in privacy, we are super stoked uh, to think about like homomorphic encryption. Uh, it's a technique where you can actually do modeling on encrypted data. And if you want to detect spam harassment on the platform without looking into member data, we are exploring can we like, will the, does this technology have promise? And we are actually super stoked about it. Um, and the other more commonly used is differential privacy. This is, as I said, like as we're collecting this race data, how do we draw learnings from it without leaking any private information? So these are roughly the two directions we are exploring. Um, and finally, on explainability, I don't have to motivate this. I think like um, so I'll touch upon like what we have been doing. And in this case as well, for all the modelers, we're building these small analysis tools, um, actually not just for modelers, but like these analysis tools that can help them understand where the errors could be concentrated. What is it that is deciding the decision on this model? What in training data is actually causing the wrong answers? So like and it's, I think um someone touched upon that as well and also towards our members explainability which looks very different than towards our modelers like what is your feed composition today looking like do you, like if we don't really realize and like can we provide the knobs to give us feedback on like hey i'm actually also interested in this and hey actually i'm not interested in this to bring it back so um these are some of the like highlighting points of uh, what we've been doing in some of these areas so Sakshi, stoked as you should be. I think I speak for everybody here when I say thank you so much for what you do. Uh, we are all very grateful, and these are really important, uh, you know, use cases. So thank you, um, Skip. You're going to be bringing us home again, uh, so no pressure, but all the pressure. Um, and the question is, uh, what consequences flow from an erosion of trust in AI ML systems? Well. Um, I'm going to condense it because I know we're out of time, but basically failures to comply with the financial laws and regulations, they affect trust in the marketplace, it impedes confidence, and as a data scientist, it's frustrating because it slows down AIML adoption, right? It makes our work less meaningful, makes it less satisfying, and ultimately harder, right? It, we're trying to affect a culture change here, and that's hard. Whenever there's a failure in a model, we generally mean, oh, the model failed to predict something with the you know, st stipulated precision recall or some other metric. 
that's a normal failure. That's expected and a standard part of the overall approach. As long as we always know when the model output isn't meeting those criteria, and therefore we can adjust how much we rely on it. The, the process established to detect and address those failures, that has to be trustworthy, right? But the model can fail. That, that's the whole point is it's predictive, right? We should know this model has a 30% uh, precision. That means 70% of the time it's wrong, right? That's, that's, that's not a failure, that's normal. We have to remember that data science is a science. It's hypothesis driven. It's a process where failure of hypothesis is expected and necessary in a changing context. As a scientist, um, I, I need continuous accurate measurement and testing. That's the part I need to trust, right? It's, it's necessary to drive the retraining, uh, the model improvement over time, and that's what makes the process trustworthy. The individual models um, may or may not be trustworthy. I just need to know when that's the case. I need to be able to trust those metrics. So that's in contrast to a regulatory or ethical failure, which is completely different. That's a matter that, that it can affect not only the responsible person, the employee, the customer, the industry, even the whole economy. That's a heavy duty responsibility. It can never be borne by a computer algorithm or a model. It's always borne by the modelers themselves, the technologists and the leaders who govern or validate that work. So that kind of failure uh, is a no brain off. Thank you, Skip, and um, absolutely, I couldn't agree more. And and thank you, uh, thank you so much to all of our presenters today. As Skip mentioned, we are just a little bit over, um, but you know, wanted to thank you all again uh, just for being here with us today and uh, for your time and patience. So thank you. Um, we will be sending out uh, the slides as well as recordings after this event. Uh, if you'd like to connect with us, we feel free to do, do so. You can um, get us on email at federal at snorkel.ai. And uh, we're looking forward to being in touch with you all soon. Thank you.